tonight, Joel has kindly um, uh, consented to uh, talk about Pearl Harbor. This is December 7th, 77 years after Pearl Harbor. So he's going to give us the real story about Pearl Harbor and about the deep state. You've heard a little bit about that. And how you and I can prepare for the economic and political turbulence which lies ahead of us. Because surely it does. He will also give his annual big picture review of the past year and his projections for when the big war is coming. Ladies and gentlemen, Joel Skousen. Before I start my presentation, I want to get to this lady who had a question that I left hanging from this previous question and answer session. You had made mention of a nuclear explosion, an EMP explosion, and our history has taught us that Japan awakened America to what we were capable of pulling together and accomplishing. We've lost a lot of our uh, infrastructure and our factories and our knowledge. What would it take? Uh, like two nuclear weapons to drop us to our knees, one and three EMPs. What? Re how weak are we? <laughs> and where would they attack other than the banking system in New York? Can you repeat your question so we'll read it back and hear it? Oh boy, okay, I'll try. <laughs> it was a long question. But essentially she's uh, saying that with the threat of EMP and uh, nuclear attack, um, how, lost, vulnerable are we? how vulnerable are we? Well, we're very vulnerable, not because we don't have a lot of weapons, but because we are so highly technical. It's so technical now, it doesn't take very much to stop our weapons from being effective. That's where EMP is very, very dangerous. Um, um, but it still takes a physical nuclear strike. You know, the military is fairly hardened against EMP. Uh, not completely, but fairly hardened. Our grid is not hardened. The, by the way, the power companies are resisting hardening the grid because they claim they don't want the federal government interfering or taking control and dictating to them how to run the grid, which would happen if the U.S. government came in to dictate how to harden it. But um, the, the point that she's making is that um, that I want to make relative to her question is it's going to be different than Pearl Harbor. Now, she said that Pearl Harbor was energized the American people, made them realize how powerful and capable their manufacturing could be. We've exported a lot of our steel industry now over to China, so we don't have the same steel making capacity that we had in World War II. We couldn't produce 100 ships a month like we were doing at the peak of World War II. We couldn't produce three or 4,000 aircraft a month like we were producing in, in World War II because we it's just too high tech now. We've traded, you know, efficiency in, uh, in, in terms of mass production of cheap, expendable weapons for high tech, very expensive F-35s, for example, you know, multiple hundreds of millions of dollars a copy, and so you can't afford very many. And it doesn't take an awful lot to bring down or stop weapons. I mean, about half of our aircraft are unavailable at any one time just because they're so technologically sophisticated. And it's very difficult to keep them flying. Um, so we are very vulnerable, but this is going to be different because for the first time in your lives, America's going to be attacked. And we are going to suffer. And it's not just the physical attack on the US military. Yes, that's devastating. It's going to be particularly devastating for those of you who have children in the military. How many of you have children in the military? Well, not as many as I thought. But you need to get them out of the military at the, before you know, we start into this next decade. Don't have them re-up. Don't keep patting them on the back about what a great job you are during saving the country. They're out there, unbeknownst to them, you know, furthering a globalist agenda. All of the intervention in Iraq, all of the intervention in Syria and Afghanistan is to create conflict, 
and hatred toward the United States and to help justify Russia and China to eventually attack us. It has nothing to do with American security. Now you say it's, and they tell President Trump, and that's why he was against going into Afghanistan. They sat him down in the Pentagon in the Situation Room and they said, you know, we have all these 150 countries where we have troops because they're halting terrorism. And he started giving them, ex uh, they started giving him reasons. We halted this terrorism. But they didn't tell him that we created the terrorist attack that we halted. That's what he doesn't know. The US deep state created ISIS, they created Al Qaeda, they did 9-11, it was a complete bl government black operation from beginning to end, including the hiring of the terrorists. And the listed, listed hijackers were not the ones actually involved in the hijacking. That's just the list of the people that they had working for the FBI. Seven of those dead hijackers are still living. And you know it's false, and the FBI has never revised their list. But this is going to be a different war, because you're not going to be able to sit at your television and watch this war proceed. You're not going to have any television, because EMP is going to take out all the electricity. They're probably going off for anywhere from two months to six months, and it only takes three days to create absolute panic and pillaging in this country, because we're so interdependent. And you think you're prepared here in Mormon country, Think again, less than 3% of the active members of the church have any significant supplies at all. Half of that have what could arguably be called a year supply. It just isn't enough. People are going to be desperate. And bishops are going to be calling you to come donate food to each other. But I'll tell you this, if you start sharing what you have, you'll all be starving in a week. I want to repeat that. If you start sharing what you've stockpiled, you'll all be starving within a week. So why prepare? If you're going to share freely, don't prepare. Because it won't do you any good. The point is, there has to be a penalty for not hearing the advice of conscience, not hearing the advice of the leaders, not hearing my advice, and preparing significantly. There has to be a consequence. Now that doesn't mean you don't prepare to help to a certain extent. I prepare with rice, for example. I have a large stockpile of rice that I can hand people a handful of rice. Okay, and they don't need a weed grinder to cook up a handful of rice, and it's cheap. They're gonna complain after a while, oh, I'm tired of the rice. Well, I'm sorry, you didn't prepare. You know, you're not being ungracious, you're giving them something. But if you open your storehouse to everybody and start sharing, you're going to be starving with them just like everyone else said. Why well, do it? Just not wise. That's why you have to conceal what you're doing so that it doesn't get stolen. So that if people come into the house, I mean, you have concealed storage. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But as I say, you know, a lot of you people have been coming and hearing my talks for several years. I give an annual talk here. It's the only talk I give here in Utah every year. And I know your concern, and I know most of you believe me, but I don't think most of you have really become prepared. I don't want you to respond. How many of you have fallout protection in your home? Don't raise your hand because you don't want to tell what you have, etc. But you answer that question. You're going to experience fallout. And don't get the attitude, well, it's too expensive, I'm going to die anyway, so I'm not going to prepare. The problem is you don't die. 50% of Hiroshima lived through it. A direct hit, 50%. And they suffered for years. They wished they were dead, but they couldn't die. You see, God determines that. So don't be apathetic about the fact that I'm just going to pack it the best way I can. You need fallout protection, and it's not that expensive. I'll tell you how to do it at the end of the talk. But this is a wake-up call. As we get closer to the year 2020, and I have never said, by the way, when this war is going to start, because we're dealing with secret combinations here. Nobody knows when it's going to start. All I am saying is that Russia and China will be ready to strike the West by the middle of the next decade. They will be ready. They are holding back now. They are not pushing the button. But they will be ready. And they're not dumb. 
they know that the United States is dangerous and they intend to be ready when they strike. Now they could be induced perhaps to strike early. So you're not necessarily safe by waiting till the middle of the day. And it could be later. The Lord can intervene. The Lord can destabilize them. He can do all kinds of things to give you more time. But don't count on it. We've had a lot of time. I have been warning about this war with Russia and China since 1980. And it's still coming. Nobody's disputing me anymore. They used to. Everybody can see that Russia and China are very, very strong and very, very belligerent now. But you still sit back and you look at the evening news and you say to yourself, well, no one else is concerned about it, so why should I be concerned about it? And that's because there's a specific program within this government never to let you, not, let you worry about it until it's too late to stop them. Now, when you find your government starts to warn about imminent war with Russia and China, you know it's coming and it's too late to stop them. That's why they're warning you. But they've been preparing. And boy, how they've been preparing. Billions of dollars in new bunkers because they know the Russians and Chinese know where the existing ones are, and they're building new ones. During 9-11, the First Lady got taken to a bunker underneath this, uh, a high-rise building in Washington, D.C. She you know, it was, it was hardly even the Secret Service didn't know there was a bunker there. They're building them. Building one during the Bush administration and with Vice President Dick Cheney, he had his own personal bunker built under the, his vice president residence at the Naval Observatory. And the only reason he found out about it is because there were so many explosions going off on the ground that the neighbors were complaining that the government had to admit they were building a bunker <coughs> under the vice president's house. Now, relative to your own preparations, by the way, since I've been using the word bunker, don't ever use that for your personal shelters. That's a code <laughs> word that rings bells at the NSA when you get emails and you call me on the phone and say, I want to do a bunker. And you don't use the B word. <laughs> it's a safe room, or it's a shelter, or it's just a secure storage. But don't use the B word. Now, I use it for government because they are building real bunkers. And they are bomb-proof bunkers. You don't have to build bomb-proof bunkers. Because if you're in a nuclear target area, that is five miles around any nuclear target, so if you'll ever force base the target, if you're within five miles, don't build a bunker, even though you're in a target zone. Move! <laughs> Relocate. Why spend the money, the extra twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars it takes to bomb-proof a shelter when you could use that money to relocate and only need fallout protection, which is relatively inexpensive to do. You see the point? Don't be apathetic, but remember, be prepared to relocate away from danger areas. Now, let me get to my main uh, topic, first of all. And the reason I'm going to talk about Pearl Harbor, not only is because it's Pearl Harbor Day, and you're bombarded with all of the typical propaganda about how we were totally innocent when dastardly Japan attacked us. You can learn more about the deep state by studying the cover-up of government operations. The government provoked Japan, had an eight-point plan to provoke Japan into attacking. And they went about it for a year and a half, provoking Japan and stopping and rejecting any move Japan had toward conciliation, toward negotiation. And so the United States was fully responsible for that. Japan did not want to attack the United States. They feared the United States. They knew what the United States was capable of doing. And we laid back, played soft, invited them to attack. They attacked, and then we came back with vengeance. Now, you do that with Russia and China, and you're not going to come back with a vengeance very easy, because they have nuclear weapons. We're the Hiroshima. We're the Nagasaki. You know? Although, I uh, want to repeat, Russia and China don't tend to hit cities first, just military targets. And so you'll have some warning. But Hill Air Force Base, the military target, the fallout will affect you, and so will the blast zone if you're that close. But you can learn a tremendous amount about the deep state and its operations. Not by the general concept that they, can, they provoked and they did something, but looking at the details of how they covered it up, what they did with people who talked about knowing that FDR knew about it, and how they pressured them. This tells you a lot about what President Trump and other people are going through today. So at 8 a.m. on December 4th, 1941, that's three days before Pearl Harbor, the U.S. Navy shortwave monitor station in Maryland 
A guy named Ralph Briggs received the message he'd been waiting for. They were the words, quote, East wind, rain. East wind, rain. Now, this was in Japanese. The U.S. had broken the Japanese diplomatic code. They got the message, East wind, rain. He immediately teletyped the message to Washington. He alone among the radio operators in Maryland knew that these three words meant East Wind Rain was one of three possible execute messages the Japanese diplomats had told their embassies to wait to hear. If they heard North Wind Cloudy, it meant they were going to attack the Soviet Union. If it said West Wind Clear, it meant they were going to attack Great Britain. If it said East Wind Rain, it meant they were going to attack the United States. So the US knew the attack was going to come on 4 December. The Roosevelt government knew, they read the Japanese code, they uh, buried the message and did not alert Pearl Harbor. After Ralph Briggs had teletyped the wind's message to Washington, it was quickly transmitted to Army Signal Intelligence to the White House. Telegraph equipment in those days produced two copies. At the sending end, one copy, uh, the original and a copy, and two <coughs> copies at the receiving end. All was carefully filed away. He additionally made a handwritten copy of the message personally and filed it away. The following week, Ralph Briggs found the station's copy missing from the files. This is the deep state in operation. Every copy of the wind's message had disappeared. Near and after the end of World War II, Briggs was ordered by superior officers not to discuss his role in the East Wind incident. Only years later, after retiring from the Navy and from civilian employment with the Navy, did he write an affidavit testifying to the disappearance of the affidavits, meaning the cover-up. He seemed, she, uh, this was a subscriber who wrote about this, uh, who knew the family. She seemed happy to talk to me. This was the second wife and told me because the first wife was blind and needed a seeing eye dog, and medical health insurance that the Navy provided, Briggs dared not violate his orders to keep quiet about the message until after she died. After she died, then he went public with the affidavit. Did you ever hear about that affidavit in the media? No. No, no. you see, that's the sin of omission. Did you ever hear the De Deseret News talk about the Briggs memorandum saying that the Roosevelt administration knew four days in advance that they actually knew a lot more than four days in advance, but this was the actual message. Now, Patrick J. Buchanan, who was a pretty good writer, uh, wrote a very interesting piece after uh, Robert Stinnett's book came out, Day of Deceit. And Day of Deceit is probably one of the best of the Pearl Harbor books that you can read, because it's the one who, through Freedom of Information Act, got all the information about the decoding and the messages and what Pearl Harbor, what FDR knew, and he has it. In fact, the, it was so effective when it came out that the NSA put out a disinformation piece trying to debunk and saying he misinterpreted it. And then he rebutted that, and boy, the rebuttal is powerful. In my World Affairs brief, I have a link to the rebuttal. Um, but anyway, Buchanan says, on December 8, 1941, Roosevelt took the roster before a joint session of Congress to ask a declaration of war on Japan. You know, the, the day that will live from infamy, you know, can you imagine someone as hypocritical as FDR? Having provoked Japan, having not warned, being personally responsible for the death of over 3,000 men, women, and children and sailors in Pearl Harbor, talking about the day that will live in infamy. He's the infamy. He's the one that is still rotting in hell, along with George Herbert Walker Bush and all other <laughs> globalist conspirators. <laughs> he told Congress, we have only one job to do now, and that is to defeat Japan. Japan. But to friends, the chief sent another message. You and I know that this continuous putting pins in the rattlesnake finally got this country bit. He was admitting to his friends that he was pricking the rattlesnake until it bit. Today, 70 years, writes Buchanan after Pearl Harbor, a remarkable secret history written from 1943 to 1963 has come to light. It is Herbert Hoover, former president, explanation of what happened before, during, and after the war. He knew what was happening. 
I mean, you would think that a former president writing a book about what really happened during World War II would get first line press, but it was buried as it told the truth. Edited by historian George Nash, it was called Freedom Betrayed, Herbert Hoover's History of the Second World War and Its Aftermath, a searing indictment of FDR and the men around him as politicians who lied prodigiously about their desire to keep America out of war, even as they took one deliberate step after another to provoke Japan into war. The book is no polemic, meaning it's not just theory and argumentation. The 50-page run-up to the war in the Pacific uses memoirs and documents from all sides to prove Hoover's indictment. And perhaps the best way to show the power of this book is the way Hoover does it, chronological, painstakingly, week by week, he goes through what everybody did. I mean, it's a powerful book. Considering the Japanese situation in the summer of 1941, bogged down in a four-year war in, J in, in China, she could neither win nor end. And the reason she couldn't end is because Mount Zedong was rising, courtesy of the Soviet Union aid, and threatening Japan. So she had to continue to fight the war, and, and it wasn't just pure aggression. A lot of it was to stop uh, you know, Mao from taking over China and from invading Japan. So there was a prime minister who was pro-United States named Fumimaro Kanoye, who desperately did not want war with the United States. And he begins to document how the US sabotaged this prime minister to get him out of office because he was pro-US and didn't want to go to war. It's very fascinating. The pro-Anglo-Saxon camp included the Navy, whose officers had fought alongside the US and Royal Navies in World War I, while the war party that is, anti-U.S. side, was centered around the Army General Tojo, who played a big role in, in Pearl Harbor, and Foreign Minister Yosuke Matsuoka, a bitter anti-American. In July 18, 1941, just about six months, less than five months before Pearl Harbor, Kanoye ousted Matsuoka, replacing him with the pro-American Admiral Toyota. The U.S. response was, on July 25th, we froze all Japanese assets in the United States, ending all exports and imports, and denied, and together with Britain, denied Japan any oil. You know, Japan doesn't have any oil. So cutting off oil is an act of war for Japan. What are you going to do? Here it is. He has an olive branch. Kanoya has an olive branch out to the United States, telling everybody they're not our enemy. And what does the U.S. do to respond? Sanctions cutting off all oil. I mean, talk about, throw it back in his face, you know, crucify the guy for uh, trying to help the United States. Stunned, Cornelia still pursued his peace policy by winning secret support from the Navy and Army to meet FDR on the U.S. side of the Pacific to hear and respond to U.S. demands. The U.S. ambassador at the time in Japan was Joseph Gru. He implored Washington not to ignore Cornelia's offer. He was a prince in the Japanese royal family. And the prince had convinced him an agreement could be reached with, and the Japanese were even willing to withdraw from into China, South and Central China. They wanted to keep Northern China in Japanese hands as a buffer against Mao Zedong coming in, which is logical. But on August 28, Japan's ambassador in Washington presented FDR with a personal letter from Kanoya imploring him to meet. Tokyo begged us to keep Kanoya's offer secret, and immediately the White House leaked it to the Herald Tribune. I mean, this is just one betrayal after another. Just stick the knife in these people. On September 6, Kanoya met again for a three hour dinner with Ambassador Gruber to tell him Japan now agreed that everything the U.S. was demanding to remove sanctions. And Gruber wrote Washington that Kanoya's warship is ready and waiting to take him to Honolulu, Alaska, or any place designated by the president. And Washington refused to respond, just left the ambassador hanging. And this is really, this is not just, we're not going to do anything, we're just going to wait for Japan to attack. This is antagonized. Stop any negotiations. So, after the meeting with President Roosevelt on, uh, in October, Secretary of War Henry Stimson wrote in his diary, and this shows you, once again, this is deep state education. This shows you how 
many people are involved and other people who are not involved. Here's the Secretary of War, fully involved. We face the delicate question of the diplomatic fencing to be done so as to be sure Japan is put into the wrong and makes the first bad move. <laughs> this is just pure conspiracy. We are going to make sure that all the goals that we're going to make sure that Japan is in the wrong, that they make the mistake, they make the first overt move. The question is, he continued, in November 25th, he said, the question is how we should maneuver the Japanese into the position of firing the first shot. So Stimson was a conspirator in this. On the 29th of November, Secretary Cordell Hall, now he was in the know, but he had a conscience. Hall wanted to fight against it. He wanted desperately to warn the American people that FDR was planning on setting this trap for Japan and provoking them. But he didn't dare do it because he was a part of the administration. And he would have been crucified and removed. So he secretly met with reporter Joseph Live. Live had formerly held several posts in the Roosevelt administration. Hall knew him and felt he was one newsman he could trust. Hall, by the way, had tried to go to other news organizations and they rebuffed him. Yeah. This is the Secretary of State. This is not just ordinary you know, administrator in the Roosevelt administration. Live believed him because the Secretary of State handed him copies of some of the Tokyo intercepts concerning Pearl Harbor. He said the Japanese were planning to strike the base and that FDR planned to let it happen. Hull made Live pledge to keep his name out of it, but hoped he would blow the story sky high in the newspapers. So, now this shows deep state tactic, and even back then, the newspapers were party to it. Even back then, but this is not new that the mainstream news is against liberty. Lee ran to the office of his friend. This is a friend in journalism. Lyle Wilson, the Washington Bureau Chief of the United Press International, like the Associated Press today, that was the big one in those days. While keeping his pledge to Hull to keep it secret, he told Wilson all the details and showed him the intercepts. Wilson replied that the story was ludicrous and refused to run it. Through connections, Live managed to get a hurried version into UP's foreign cable, not US. Wouldn't let it on the US, but the foreign cable. And it was picked up by two newspapers, guess where? Hawaii. The Honolulu Advertiser, and I've got links in this story here to the Hon pictures of the Honolulu Advertiser. Japan to attack next week, one week before the Sunday that Japan to Hawaii was warned. Honolulu Advertiser. And the Hilo Tribune had the same thing, picked it up. So both major islands, Oahu and Hilo, were warned of the Japanese attack. They made it to newspapers. But because nobody in official them followed up and showed any concern, because, and I don't know what Short and Kimmel did, you know, Short was in charge of the Army and Kimmel in charge of the Navy. Did they telegraph Washington and say, what about this newspaper article? Did they even read the newspaper? I don't know. But they were warned in Hawaii. Isn't that ironic, though? The only newspaper in the United States to publish the warning was in Hawaii. And yet everyone was totally unprepared. How is that possible? That's the mentality we're dealing with today, ladies and gentlemen. That's what you deal with when you try to tell your uninformed neighbors about these conspiracies. Oh, um, I'm not reading about it in the Desert News, so it can't be true. <laughs> <laughs> Well, there were other things in the cover-up that happened uh, after this uh, or before. For example, there's a story of Tyler Kent in England. He was a code clerk at the U.S. Embassy in London, and he discovered secret dispatches between Roosevelt and Churchill well before the Pearl Harbor attack. These revealed that FDR, contrary to campaign promises, was determined to engage America in the war. He was actually talking to Churchill. I've got a plan to get the US into the war. Don't you worry. We're going to get the, into the war. We'll be supporting you 100%. Kent smuggled some of the documents out of the embassy, hoping to alert the American people, but he was caught. Now, this tells you something else, too, about how the Lord works with these things. He lets things happen, bad things happen. You know, he could have let can't escape with the documents and not get caught. Now, would it have made any difference? I don't think so. 
because he'd gone to the newspapers. Would the newspapers have printed it? Not in your life, because they're part of the conspiracy. But it's interesting that he, uh, Lord, the uh, poor guy, get caught. He was put in prison for the rest of the war for trying to alert the American people about the danger of his own administration. These are the uh, four of the major eight-point plan that uh, Robert Stinnett's books talks about the, to uh, provoke Japan. Um, one, they froze her assets, all of the money, and we've done that to Iran, we've done that to Russia, we've done to other ones, and that's all provocation. Uh, you know, a lot of the conservative, you know, were blaming Obama for giving back, or for, for giving Iran $150 billion. Remember those complaints? Remember, that was Iran's own money. It wasn't that we were giving Iran $150 billion. That was their money. We were simply returning what was rightfully there because the sanctions were never valid. Closing the Panama Canal to her shipping, progressively halting vital export to Japan until we finally joined Britain in a total oil embargo of Japan. Boy, that was the clincher. Sending a hostile note to the Japanese ambassador implying military threats to Tokyo if they did not alter their Pacific pol uh, policies. And uh, that was just 11 days before the attack. In other words, we threatened them with military attack and that just gins up the military in Japan, says, well, we'd better plan on you know, uh, attacking if they're going to attack us. So, as I said, the ambassador to Japan, Japan is a hairy carry nation, more likely to fling itself into national suicide for honor than allow herself to be humiliated. And that's a very cogent remark about the Japanese people. They would rather commit suicide than be dishonored the way that the Roosevelt administration was treating them. Now, we see this happening with Iran. Uh, Israel's really doing most of the provoking. Israel attacks Iranian forces almost weekly in Syria. And Iranians are very smart. They are not rising to the attack. All Israel wants to do is have Iran attack back in Israel, and all of a sudden the US and Israel would go 100% all guns against Iran. And, they, and they're going to do something similar to what we did in Iraq. This was part of my brief this week on George W. Bush. In Iraq, they just didn't go in to attack Saddam Hussein militarily. They went and destroyed power plants, the sewer system. They killed over 70,000 people in Iraq in the first Gulf War because of hitting infrastructure. The Israelis did that in the last Lebanon War. Instead of hitting military targets, they went and hit power plants and sewer plants and uh, all the electric, the infrastructure, all of the interconnection. They wanted to just make, you know, why do they do this? If you're trying to defend yourself, why do you go in and destroy civilians? Why do you destroy the infrastructure? Because they're trying to create hatred against Israel, hatred against the West. You see, Israel, despite all you hear about, you know, 10 tribes or Jews being restored to their homeland, and this is the gospel, we need to support Israel. Israel is a, a country run by globalists. Ever since Ariel Sharon was a globalist, Netanyahu was a globalist, he's a Kissinger protege. Kissinger and Associates paid for his education in Washington, got him his first job in Wall Street. He's not a right wing, he's just pretending to be right wing. He's a globalist, and that's what globalists do, they provoke and they hit civilians and they create hatred. They don't want peace, they want destruction and war. Um, let me talk a little bit now about Donald Trump. Because if ever, in my review of what's happened over the world revolves around Donald Trump. Not because Donald Trump has really stopped much of the globalist agenda. He hasn't. He's been singularly unsuccessful. But the world revolves around Donald Trump because he's so unpredictable. He's unpredictable to us, the promises that he made us. But he's unpredictable to them, too, because they talk him into something, and he talks himself out of it the next day. And they have to do it all over again. They have to keep manipulating, because he is unstable. Sometimes that's good. Sometimes it isn't. Depends on whose side of the fence you are. But you see, one of the things that I'm most disappointed of, and I 
you know, I'm on Alex Jones very often, and I remember him talking with Roger Stone and other people names in the White House saying, Trump knows everything about conspiracy that we do. Trump is with us. Trump is going to you know, do this and going to do that. And I was skeptical because Trump doesn't have anything in his background that tells me that he's ever been an ideological conservative, that he ever knows about the deep state. He knows how to say the words about conspiracy or deep state, but does he really know what's happening? I don't think so. The proof of that is how many people he has named in his administration that are deep state insiders. Now, you notice, of course, he, uh, he fired James Comey. He said things initially very nice about James Comey until James Comey betrayed him and worked hand in glove with Hillary Clinton. And so who does he replace him with? Christopher Wray, another deep state insider. Christopher Wray was involved in the 9-11 cover-up. He was involved with the Enron cover-up. Uh, and so uh, it's no wonder, for example, that he just sent the FBI to raid the home of a whistleblower who had information on Hillary Clinton and the uh, illegal things she was doing in her foundation, as well as the Uranium One scandal of giving, you know, if anybody's colluding with the Russians, Hillary Clinton and handing over the Uranium. But she wasn't doing it because, not, not only for money, you know, they always take a big cut. They get these million dollar donations, and then under the table they're doing something for someone. But, you know, she's a globalist, and so she's basically helping Russia get arms and weapons and ammunition, et cetera, because they're trying to build an enemy. And that's what happens even during the Republican administration. It's the Department of Commerce that authorizes the transfer of technology to China. It happens all the time. And what they can't get through to China, they get through Israel. Israel, we give technology to Israel, and Israel sells it to China. The U.S. knows about it, but the U.S. likes that because we don't get blamed. The finger points at Israel. Of course, they never tell you that in the press because the Israelis have a huge lobby. AIPAC and others own a good portion of Congress and most of the press. They will never criticize Israel. He named Alex Lazar, CEO of Eli Lilly, as chief of HSS. That's putting the fox in charge of the hen house. So it's a little wonder that Daniel Best another industry insider who was tasked by President Trump to get the big pharma to lower drug prices, ended up dead in November. A blunt, multiple hits of blunt force trauma, said the medical examiner. Now think about it, multiple hits of blunt force trauma. That means he gets hit on the head multiple times and he rules it a suicide. <laughs> How do you commit suicide hitting yourself multiple times on the head? It's like the person who gets three gunshots in the head and says it's a suicide. Who pulled the trigger the other two times? It's just incredible. You know, in every major city, I made this point in the very first brief, every major city has a coroner or a medical examiner that is corrupt that they can call upon to distort the facts when they want someone suicided. And of course, the major problem was Vince Foster. During the Clinton administration, he was their final financial advisor. He's the one who set up the secret bank accounts in Switzerland for the Clintons, where they hide all their cash. And he was on the hot seat going before a congressional committee the week that he was killed. And of course, they labeled him a suicide. But as Patrick Walton, the key witness who was in the parking lot at Fort Marcy Park, said, Vince Foster's automobile, his red Honda, was not in the parking lot when his body was found. So how did he get there? And of course, they crucified Patrick Knowlton, tried to discredit him. They sent burly FBI agents while he was arrested on to glare at him and to bump into him in the street and, and say snarly things to them. He was shocked, you know, when he got to the Ken Starr hearing, good Republican Ken Starr running this uh, deep state cover-up. And he sees these very same FBI agents on the days with with Ken Starr. They were the ones that were harassing him. This, was a, this is how the deep state operates. This is the dark side of the US government. Now, I don't believe for a minute that all those FBI's are total, FBI agents who were involved with it are totally knowing about the conspiracy and what the purpose of it is. We've got too many people who just take orders in government. And that comes from military training. You just take orders. You don't question. You follow. And if you 
are ambivalent about it, and they show some reticence, you know, you get threatened with your job and, uh, and other things, or worse. Brett Kavanaugh, for example, his choice for in the Supreme Court is deep state. Now, sure, he's somewhat conservative in his judicial groomings, but he was on the Ken Starr Commission. He was the one who went after Patrick Norton. You can't tell me he didn't know there was a cover-up going on, and he had to get that witness and make sure he didn't uh, didn't uh, tell what he knew. So he helped cover up the Vince Foster murder. Neil Gorsuch, not a strict constitutionalist, but neither does he appear to be deep state. I'm worried a little bit about Bill or William Barr, who's just been nominated by President Trump to replace Jeff Sessions. Jeff Sessions needed to be removed. I don't think he was a deep state conspirator, but I think they had some dirt on him because he was just, I mean, he just wouldn't do anything. He was just out to lunch the entire period of time. He was attorney general. Uh, so he replaces him with William Barr, who is very much establishment. He is a Catholic. He is anti-abortion. He did have the courage to say, by the way, at his confirmation hearing as attorney general, when they asked him what he thought about Roe versus Wade, he said, I'm paraphrasing, I don't believe the Constitution ever authorized the right to abortion. And I don't believe the rule first way was correctly interpreted. Joe Biden, who was a senator at that time, said, well, that's certainly a refreshing answer for the first time. Someone has not evaded the question. And it's true. You notice in Kavanaugh's hearing and Gorsuch, they all evade the question. It's settled law. I'm not going to do anything. But they won't ever commit to whether or not they are for or against abortion. But he did. Bravo. But that was 20 years ago. Now, this guy did take part in the cover-up in the Iran-Contra affair. He was attorney general during H.W. Bush, and H.W. Bush would not have chosen, being a, a pure-bred globalist, would not have chosen someone to be attorney general if he didn't know that he was reliable in that regard. So they are experts at choosing conservatives that can disarm you into thinking, these are one of you guys, so you easily get confirmed. But there's also something else uh, in the background. So I'm a little concerned about uh, uh, William Barr as Attorney General. He has even made some statements critical of Hillary Clinton in the Uranium One deal and of her email scandals and have said, he's openly said, she needs to be investigated. But I think you'll see that he still will do nothing once he gets in office. It's just like Matt Whitaker, the temporary AG. I mean, this guy was a firebrand. He was going to go after Comey and after him, and he did, did nothing in the weeks that he was in there. And part of the reason, of course, is the media just heaped hatred upon him that he had said all these things, and therefore he's got to recuse himself. And because they attacked so strongly about recusing himself, it neutered him. Now, a person of courage would have gone ahead and said, you know, this is the right thing to do, and I'm going to do it. But he did, did nothing. And that's what I think will happen to Barr as well. Let me talk a little bit about Trump's successes. There are a few of them. And unfortunately, most of them have been negated over time. They were successes in the beginning, and now they've been overcome. For example, he had a ban on Muslims coming into the United States with refugees. Well, that's been totally overcome. The refugee flows are just the same. They were overcome by the State Department and by the courts blocking them. I was able, I proposed in the World Affairs Brief relative to immigration, this is one of his big failures, the failure to stop illegal immigration despite all of the rhetoric. And the bigger failure though is not to stand up to the courts. For example, I put out in the World Affairs Brief about a couple of months ago, I said, you know what Trump needs to do? He needs to make, make a change in policy by executive order to state Anyone who is in the country illegally cannot apply for asylum. It makes you ineligible. What does that do? It makes, takes away all the incentive to come across the border illegally. And if you get caught, they, the leftist attorney tells them, you just apply for asylum. And then they have to let you go and let you stay while you have a two-year wait for your court. And then you can disappear. But you see, if you can't apply for asylum, if you're caught in the country illegally, it takes away the whole incentive to come across the border. They want to wait on the other side, otherwise they lose the chance. Well, Trump isn't allowed to read my World Affairs brief, but someone in Senator Mike Lee's office got a copy of my brief and sent it on to the president. And the senator can get through. 
And what happened? Two weeks ago, Trump came out and said, if you're in the border illegally, you're not going to be able to apply for asylum. Immediately, the courts say, that's illegal. You go to the liberal California court. Trump lambasted for being an Obama judge. The judge shop, of course, the ACLU has lawyers in every county in the country. They can judge shop uh, a favorable judge, and sure enough. But you know what's really interesting? This was a clear-cut case where the judge violated the law by saying that Trump violated the law because Trump attorneys gave him in black and white the exception to the law that said, under various circumstances, the president can suspend any of these immigration rules when there is a, a need, which is in black and white. So he isn't violating the law because there's an exception. And he gave it to the judge, and the judge said, well, I don't care what that says. You're in violation of the law. But Trump should have said, the judge is wrong. You know, there's a, the, the, the judicial department of the United States Constitution is not superior to the executive. It's not superior to Congress. There are three co-equal branches of government. Three co-equal branches. And the president has the right to say, like FDR said, and the left never protested, but FDR said, let the judges enforce their ruling because they have no enforcement powers. The only enforcement power really of the judges is if it's egregious enough and Congress agrees, they can impeach the president. And the, pre and the president, if he had the courage to have said to the Congress, you know, if you disagree that this black and white man language giving me the exception to legally do this, then impeach me. But there's the language. The same thing he should have said when the courts blocked his denial of transgenders in the military. He should have said, I am the commander in chief. By the Constitution, the courts have nothing to say about the military and who can join them. This is strictly the exclusive jurisdiction of the government. If you disagree, impeach me. Of course, the Republican Congress never would have impeached him. The Democrat Congress coming in would impeach him. But remember, filing articles of impeachment doesn't mean that you're out of office. It has to go to the Senate, and the Senate has to convict. And I don't think the Republican Senate would convict a Republican president in this thing. But Donald Trump did the right thing by trying, he did the right thing by trying to get rid of birthright citizenship. But you know, it took one day for the media to heap all kinds of criticism on the president about how it's illegal, how it's obstruction, how you, it's settled law. And it's not settled law. It's strictly a judge's interpretation, a bad interpretation of the 14th Amendment, which talks about all children born of people under the jurisdiction of the United States. And it was a post-slavery, post-Civil War amendment to the Constitution so that all Negro children and other people under the jurisdiction were citizens when they were born. It was never intended. In fact, there was a justice in just after the Civil War that clearly said this is never intended to allow illegal aliens to drop a child in the United States and have to be a citizen. And Trump backed on immediately and said, well, I'll let Congress do it. And what did Rat Ryan do? Nothing. So you see, I'm very disappointed in Donald Trump. He has good instincts. He does the right things initially, some of the right things. But he doesn't follow through. And why doesn't he follow through? I mean, this is a tough-minded businessman, right? Well, he is about money, but he has no knowledge, no experience about argumentation of detailed law and conservative issues. He's never argued them. Never in his life has he ever had an argument for conservative things to another person. How do you expect to go up to these globalist advisors and talk them out of what they're trying to tell you? I mean, it takes real experience to do that. He's just unprepared to be president of the United States. And so what does he do? He turns to advisors. But all his advisors have been purged of anyone who knows anything about the Constitution or anything but mainstream. For example, who did he put in as director of personnel? Johnny DiStefano. Johnny DiStefano was the former longtime aide to House Speaker John Boehner. And you know who John Boehner was, betrayal John Boehner, who never did a conservative thing as his life, former Republican National Committee chairman staffer. So that's like Ryan's pre-boots you bring in after you become president to pick your staff in the White House. Trump was unprepared. How do you pick 4,000 people to staff the White House West Wing when you don't know any conservatives? You palled around with Hillary Clinton. 
all your life. You know, there are movie stars and prostitutes and other things. Now, I'm not a never Trumper. Never have been. I was optimistic. I was hopeful that Trump would do the right thing. His rhetoric was fine. I was always skeptical. I said, look, we'll see if he can follow through, because I know how powerful the deep state is, and I know how powerful the entrenched forces of Congress are. But he's been very disappointing in the lack of staying power, the lack of pushing back when he, he turns around so quickly. Nothing is more symptomatic than what happened in North Korea. North Korea is an existential threat to the United States. Afghanistan is not. Syria is not. Iraq is not. Iran is not. North Korea is. Russia is. China is. And you know, he says, I'm going to solve this problem one way or the other. It's either going to be the winner or I'm going to do a military solution. So he gets together with Kim Jong-un in June in Singapore and has a, a love affair with Kim Jong-un. He just wows him with it. You know, and that's because when Xi Jinping, China, came to Mar-a-Lago and met with China, Trump, he just poured on the flattery. Trump melted like butter and came out saying, what a wonderful person Xi Jinping is. What do you mean, wonderful person? You know what the gulags in China are like? I mean, this is a communist country. This is something that has many, many millions of prisoners. The abortion rate, you know, they used to go through not abortion, but the one child policy. I mean, this is a criminal country. And he says, what a wonderful person he is. It tells you a lot about Donald Trump as a poor judge of character. How do you get to be a poor judge of character? How do you get to be a good judge of character? By listening to the nervous feelings of conscience that come that will give you warning signals when you meet somebody that's shifting. You know, the little warning bells go off. Ah, oh, watch out for this guy. But you see, when you dedicate your life to disregarding conscience in your moral life, you're immoral and you, you push that signal, you get penalized. You don't get the signals before. And your mind becomes callous to those things. You don't deserve the kinds of promptings. That's why he keeps making mistakes. He's met with Kissinger, Henry Kissinger, arch globalist, four times in the White House, and thinks he's a wonderful person. He met with Obama right after he was elected and came out saying he's a wonderful person. He said wonderful things about Hillary Clinton, Locker up Clinton. Now, to his credit, he did go to his Justice Department or his attorneys and said, I want Hillary Clinton investigated and prosecuted. And what did they tell him? His own attorney said, oh, no, you can't do that. The Justice Department is independent of the executive. That's a lie. The Justice Department is part of the executive branch, and he is the chief prosecutor. He can direct the Justice Department. He can direct them. But you know, only when a Republican is in office do they tell a Republican president, no, no, you can't direct. They're independent. But when a Democrat is in there, they're like hand in glove. Obama calls Eric Holder, and, you know, and he does what he says, and the press never Never says nay. Never says it's independent. It's just a for, it's a facade only for Republicans. So his own attorneys talked him out of it and saying you can't direct them. Uh, you have to wait. Of course, Rod Rosenstein was running the Justice Department, so they knew that nothing would happen. And then they said if you insist, they'll get you for obstruction of justice. They always keep throwing that at. How is wanting to prosecute someone for a crime obstructing justice? It's the Justice Department obstructing justice. It's Rod Rosenstein who refused multiple subpoenas to give documentation to the House Intelligence Committee on the memo that was telling who was the FBI spy in the Trump administration and what he was telling. Now, I'll tell you the reason why I think the memo could not be released and was redacted is because the spy is still in there. And if Rod Rosenstein were to unredact that, Trump and everybody else would know who the spy was. Well, there's actually multiple spies. So this is a real rat's nest that Trump has inherited. But to a large extent, it's his own fault, because one, he goes in unprepared. Number two, he can't tell black from white who's good and who's bad. He just doesn't have the experience. He doesn't have the, a good sense of conscience from chronic betrayals of conscience. He doesn't have the, the Lord helping him to perceive these things because he's not a righteous person. Does that mean I would vote for a Mitt Romney or the mainstream people trying to bend over backwards and please him? No way. I still would rather live with my hope that Donald Trump will do the right thing. 
But this much is what I'm here to tell you tonight. You know, there's, there's a real problem with the Trump supporters. They tend to get very defensive when you criticize Trump, even when you do it on principle. And it's almost impossible to get rid of the hope inside that he's going to save us. I think it's secretly because Trump supporters don't want to prepare for the worst. They don't want to prepare for what's coming. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of hazard. You know, it's, it's a very dark picture of losing liberty, of getting, of admitting that there are secret combinations in charge of them and that you can't get them out. And that we're going to have war. And so they'd rather go on year after year hoping that Donald Trump is going to save them. But I'm here to tell you, I've lost any hope that Donald Trump is going to save this nation or turn anything around. At best, he's going to continue to slow them down, give us a little more time, but that's the best he's going to do. He's going to slow them down, and he has slowed them down a little bit, except in a few areas. In foreign policy, he hasn't slowed them down a whit. He's bought into every false intelligence about Syrian chemical weapons that they've thrown at him. He's bought into the entire mantra about Iran being the biggest sponsor of terror in the world. Iran isn't the biggest sponsor of terror in the world. The United States is. With his whore, Saudi Arabia, who's feeding and funding a lot of these terrorist organizations. And Israel is deeply involved. The Mossad does all of the training of the terrorist leaders because they are the best at infiltrating Arab countries. They don't do it with Israelis, they do it with Israeli Arabs. Arabs that live in Israel, they train how to infiltrate because Arabs can infiltrate Arabs. And they go, and so the, the terrorists don't know that their leaders are Mossad trained, that are taking orders from the US and British intelligence. They just know that they've been riled up about, you know, kill the West and, and do terrorism. But the leaders know and that's why in every single terrorist attack, whether it's Mosul, when you go after ISIS, or whether it's Raqqa, they saved the ISIS leaders. They left a big sector in Mosul open so that ISIS could escape out that sector and go to Raqqa. And when Raqqa fell, guess who saved, Raqqa, uh, saved ISIS? The United States paid for about 50 or 60 semi-trucks driven by Arab drivers to go in Iraq and take out ISA, their families, and their heavy weapons. And where did they go? They reintegrated them into the Syrian rebel forces that the US is publicly backing. That's where they came from originally. US and British intelligence came in and basically said, you guys are now ISIS. Take about half of them, they're going to get funding priority. Now they didn't tell them, you know, dressed in my, my camouflage uniform with the U.S. Uh, you know, these were Israeli Arabs, uh, you know, terrorist leaders telling them, we're now going to be ISIS and this and that. And that's how ISIS was, was created. How else do you get the largest terrorist organization in the world that comes into being within six months, out of nowhere, and has suddenly 50,000 people? You don't do that by recruitment, by normal and training. You do that by simply taking existing and separating them and not giving them a name change. That's how all, you know, remember everything was Al-Qaeda before 9-11, or through 9-11, etc. And all of a sudden it was ISIS and Al-Qaeda wasn't even heard of anymore. Now Al-Qaeda's coming back. Why? Because ISIS has to be defeated. They're reintegrated back into the Syrian rebel forces, so now Al-Qaeda's on the, on the rise again. This is all provoked. This is all engineered. This is what you're dealing with. It's very sophisticated. If Trump knew only one thing, if I were to sit down with him, and I, even for five minutes, and say, one thing you need to know is that the deep state created ISIS and runs terrorism around the world with the help of Saudi Arabia that you are supporting. And you're supporting Saudi Arabia to kill Yemenis. And you're responsible for that. But it wouldn't do any good because he'd be very defensive. You know, it's very hard to tell a very strong ego person what's, uh, you know, that, he, that he's been snookered, and he really has. Now, let's talk about us and what we can do about it. There was a very discouraged call on KTOP this morning. I'm on Friday mornings at 8 o'clock where I give a summary of the World Affairs Brief. 
And a very discouraged lady said, you know, this is just so negative. When I talk to people, I want to give them hope. I want to give them hope that we're going to win, because otherwise they just don't want to hear. They just don't. They want positive, you know, thinking. And I'm, I wish I could help her, you know, say, but I have to admit, you know, I'm completely pessimistic about winning. Now, and her response was, that means we do nothing, right? No, 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 it doesn't mean that you do nothing. Just because you're losing doesn't mean you do nothing. Look at Moroni. Did, did Moroni go into the battle, the last battle, saving the Nephi because he thought he was going to win? No, he knew that the entire race was going to die, and that he would eventually die along with it, or his father, you know. And yet he still fought. Why do you still fight a losing battle? Because this is a test to develop, see if you're going to develop courage. If you can see right from wrong, the test isn't to be happy. We're told that the purpose of life is to be happy. The purpose of life is to be tested, to be true to the truth. And you only do that through coming up against evil and fighting evil and helping other people to see that's where you win. You don't win by becoming happy and not having any problems in the world. You win by fighting. You win by learning to argue. You win by learning to think. And so, as I told her, I said, you know, one of your problems is that you probably get very discouraged when you people brush you off and you try to tell them about something that's uncomfortably true. And they say, I don't worry about those people anymore. I don't even talk to them. They give me the brush off and they roll their eyes and I turn around and I talk to someone else who senses that something's wrong. That's how you avoid discouragement. Talk to the people who sense that something's wrong. There's at least some hope there. Yeah, be careful not to unload everything on them at once. <laughs> but, you know, give them a little bit of a time and see if it takes. It's just like in missionary work. If you want to convert somebody, you don't just unload the whole thing at once. You give them a little bit and see if they respond spiritually. If you do some fellowship, and see if they respond. If they're not interested, if they don't feel anything attractive about your lifestyle, then you're not going to get to first base. So you see, you want to take things slowly and see if people will respond. And listen to the little still small voice of conscience that tells you nervous feelings, if you're pushing too hard, calm feelings, if you're doing it just right. But this is a battle of testing that we're in. And there are people out there who need to know the truth. And you can be a vehicle in teaching them the truth. That's one of the reasons why I put out the World Affairs Brief. The World Affairs Brief is my weekly news analysis service. And I do it from a conspiratorial perspective. I try to tell you what the dark side of government is doing, what's behind these moves. It's stuff that you don't get in the mainstream media. At the same time, I try to correct what I think are bogus conspiracy theories so that you don't run out repeating things. How many people have you got these really slick emails that are very conservative sounding about, you know, Obama did this and this and this and this and this, and, and there's no signature at the bottom. There's no name on it. And they say, pass it on. And you pass it on. <laughs> Don't do that. There's always errors in it. Anybody who doesn't put their signature on it, there's errors in it. And that's why the signature's not there. They're doing it to make you look silly. So that you pass it to someone who checks, goes to Snopes.com or PolitiFact. And says, look, you just blew it. You know, this is. And it isn't that it's all wrong. It's usually generally true. But there will be specific facts. It's like this email that went around showing a speech by Obama who was talking about locking people up and taking away their liberty and stuff. And, and everyone said, look, they're in black and white. He's saying he's going to take away people's liberty. And it was cut out of context. I went to the original speech, and he was saying, now some people will say, take their liberty away and so And they cut that part off so that it appears that he was doing that. Well, Obama is an evil guy. I'm not defending Obama. I'm just saying that was a trap set for conservatives to pass that around, and then some liberal's going to point out, no, you took that out of conflict, or you get discredited. So just be careful, even though it seems true. There are sites out there, for example, that do nothing but satire. They don't tell you it's satire. They do things and they say, what, what is it that conservatives really want to believe in? Well, we'll make up a story and have them pass it on, and you get embarrassed. Why am I telling you this? Because you've got to be very careful. You gotta be very careful. You can't leave your brains behind when you're on the internet. You've got to think, 
and listen to nervous feelings that warn you, ah, 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 something's not right there. Get good at listening because someday when war comes and when you're having to flee and you're having to do, and, and you know, you're going to depend on having a good conscience of nervous feelings. And oftentimes in these speeches I've told people, you know, 90% of the training of your conscience are temporal promptings. They're not spiritual about home teaching or your Sunday school lesson. They're about weight control. They're about time wasting. They're about exercise. They're about disciplining your children. They're about picking things up that you walk by. Things that you disregard all day long. You don't realize that when you disregard the little temporal promptings and you put them aside and say, no, I don't really know, I'm too tired. And of course, Satan was right there on the, on the other shoulder saying, no, you're too tired, you don't want to do that. You should do your homework. No, 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 you want to play first, you know. That's what caught me as a youth, you know. I always got those promptings to do my homework, but no, no, you want to play first, you're too tired. Satan is just as good as can be about knowing exactly what you want to hear and remember, you have your own innate set of weaknesses that you came with, not God-given. You developed them before you came here. You have innateness, and it's hard to overcome your innate set points. Some people are innately soft, and it's like the devil getting them to be tough. Some people are innately hyper, and it's like the devil getting them to be calmed down and take it smoothly. But that's what you need to concentrate on. Conscience is always after you to get after your innate weaknesses. And you are innately resistant to every prompting that comes. And the more you resist, the more you offend God. Now, I don't care how many times you talk about God being unconditionally loving, etc. That's not the way conscience works. He's not sitting there comforting you all day long and saying, what a good job you're doing. If you're listening, he's after you all day long saying, oh, come on, get up, do this, pick that up, do that. I mean, it's not clear like this. Remember, it comes in your own grammar. It sounds like you talking to yourself. That's the way conscience works. You get a spiritual problem, and it's interpreted in your own voice and grammar. It sounds exactly like you talking. It takes a good deal of experience to determine, and when Satan impresses you, it sounds like you talking too. So how do you tell the difference? Over time and experience, you get good at saying, OK, that didn't work out too well. When I followed that, I thought that would be neat to do. And so you realize that was a temptation. And, and it's pretty easy to understand when you get reminders, you know, you forgot something. But how many times do you give the Lord credit for that? When you're walking out the door and you're just reminded to go back and get something. And you say, oh, that's smart of me. And you go back and get But give credit to the Lord. That's how you, you make good points for the Lord. That's how you tell him you appreciate the little still small voice. Forget about dreams and visions and the big stuff. That's a trap. <coughs> Satan has been given great power to get dreams and visions. And I'll tell you why they're not trustworthy. Because they are all over the map. Now they're all about preparedness. They're all about last days and hard times. So they have the ring of general truth. But the specifics are almost always contradictory and wrong. And what's worse, it gets you dependent on who's having the next dream and vision instead of the still small voice in your mind, which is what your real power is to get personal <coughs> revelation. And I should call it inspiration. I dif distinguish. Revelation is where you get physical, sensory information. It's very rare. Inspiration is what the Lord wants to deal with because it takes refinement to deal with inspiration. It takes sensitivity to it. Any dummy can get a revelation. It doesn't take any smarts when you have an angel appearing to you and talking to you. I mean, it's just there. But it takes a great deal of spiritual expertise to get inspiration and to distinguish it from temptation and rationalization. And that's why if you, let me put it this way. You know, one of them, the biggest problems I found on a, on a theological note is in Sunday school class, they talk all the time about listening to the Spirit, how wonderful it is to listen to the Spirit. And I made a very unpopular comment once in class, and I said, you know, but the real test, if you're listening, is if you change. If you're changing. How many of you have changed your weight in the last 10 years downward? 
No, it's all gone up, right? It just keeps going up. If your weight keeps going up, you're missing proteins. Even if you try occasionally, if it keeps going up, you're missing proteins because the Lord will be after you. And it's not just about starving conditions, thyroid conditions, there's lots of other things, there's exercise, but if you're not changing, you're not listening. So stop listening for the Relief Society lesson, and the, the prompting of, of service, that's the rare thing. The point is 90% of what you're getting is temporal, and if you're not changing temporally and getting in better shape and fitter and better at, your, at what you're doing, you're not listening. <laughs> And unbeknownst to you, you're being penalized because you won't get warned when you need to be warned. I once missed a great warning that cost me thousands of dollars early in my married life. And when I complained to the Lord bitterly about it, how come the, because I actually did get a little reminder that I disregarded. And the words came to me because you have so often disregarded you didn't deserve a better warning. And from that day forward, I started to, I made a commitment to listen to every little prompting. And I was shocked at how many there were when I made a commitment to start listening. I was shocked that walking down the hall, when you get a thought, you should pick that piece of paper, you really should pick it up, even when it's inconvenient. You know, the little things matter. We're talking about survival here. And that's why I'm saying your biggest survival is going to be listening to context. Now, I've talked about war coming. And it is coming. Sure as I'm living here, it's coming and it's going to be worse than what you've ever experienced before in your life. I don't say that to discourage you. I say that because you need to prepare even as you fight for liberty, even as you fight to encourage people to come to the truth, you mustn't be satisfied when you must prepare for the takedown as you fight for what's right. Don't have confidence in men overcoming the secret combinations. I think we've passed the time when you can do that. I think the time was actually many years ago. When you look at what they did to cover up the killing of Jack Kennedy, and you know, it takes years sometimes for enough whistleblowers to come out to really know how much pressure there was, how many tentacles they had, how many people they had to stop and kill, and, you know, how many people the Clintons, they didn't have killed, but the handlers around the Clintons killed over 50 people to protect the Clintons from their drug dealing in Arkansas and for the bond scandal and everything. We learned a lot 20 years after the fact. But you know, when a conspiracy happens, it just hardly ever anything comes out immediately. We're going to learn a lot more someday about probably Daniel Best and, and who killed him and about Vince Foster. We know a lot more now because of that. But so what I'm saying is, is that we need to understand that the conspiracy is very, very powerful. Donald Trump is not going to stop it. And above all, don't believe anything that Q says. <laughs> Q is an insider disinformation expert working for the deep state. And he is targeting you who believe in Donald Trump and you who believe in conspiracy. He has sworn up and down that in November, I guess it was the second week, that they were going to indict 35 you know, big wigs. It never happened. And of course, does he have an excuse of why he didn't? Of course he's got an excuse to keep people believing. Hillary Clinton is never going to be indicted. Neither is James Comey. And neither are any of the other deep state because they control the courts. They control the Justice Department. Even if they were indicted, they wouldn't get prosecuted. It's just like Judge Royce Lambert on the FISA court. He used to be a judge in the uh, District Court of Washington, D.C. And Judicial Watch always goes before Judge Royce Lambert because he's very favorable to them. And he always lambasts the federal uh, prosecutors and the judges for lying to him. And but he never sanctions them. So he th you think he's on our side, but he never sanctions them. How else do you get on the FISA court unless you're an insider judge? The FISA court, do they ever question the government when they come up with them with, with an eavesdropping from NSA, illegal wiretap? 
and they want to get a warrant to go wire jump, does the judge go, where did you get that information you're bringing to me? No, they never ask. Because they'd have to tell them it was an illegal wiretap or a legal NSA spy, because we do everything. You know the NSA tells you that we only collect metadata, right? You can't get the metadata without the content. It's all together. Oh, you can run through a computer program to remove the content. You think the NSA does that? Come on. <coughs> James Clapper says, we don't spy on Americans. It's just not right line. That's the deep state. That's got, but remember, the deep state is not, as Sean Hannity thinks on Fox News, a bunch of Obama holdovers in the uh, bureaucracies that are anti-Trump. That's not the deep state. That's what Sean Hannity, he doesn't believe in conspiracy. He won't ever believe that the deep state took down JFK or MLK or RFK or uh, TW800, etc., and covered up those things, let alone 9-11. Neither does Rush Limbaugh. He used to believe in conspiracy, but when he got that first big billion dollar contract for the big radio, he's started to excoriate his own followers. But last week, you, you talked about that with me. I don't believe in that stuff. That's what happens when you join the dark side. So you've got to watch out for people who pretend to be conservatives like Fox News. Now, the only one who's really legitimate that I like on Fox News is Tucker Carlson. And he may not last long. He's under more and more fire all the time because he's just really Someone who, he's, he knows he has to be careful. You watch how he doesn't ever mention a conspiracy word. But boy, you get the message. He's really questioning them. Boy, he was the only one to take the government to task for claiming that Assad did chemical weapons that justified this last one. Why would he do that, he said. Absolutely correct. Why would he do that when everybody's watching? What good does it do? Why gas civilians? When you know the whole United States and everybody else is going to attack you, you have to be insane. This guy's a, a, a mild-mannered, uh, medically trained doctor. He's not stupid to do chemical weapons. And he isn't. It's the US-backed rebels that are doing chemical weapons, provided by Saudi Arabia. All false flag stuff. So in talking about us, we need to understand that this conspiracy is not going to be beat by Donald Trump. Even if I were the President of the United States, it would be hard to do it, because how do you prosecute when the judges are controlled? You'd have to get the actual conversations of them conspiring against the government. That means you'd have to go into the NSA and say, give me the wiretaps. And they'd say, what wiretaps? Well, you tap everything. I want every email that uh, David Rockefeller or the Rothschild sent and or Henry Kissinger and Zbigniew Brzezinski sent in the past 10 years, and I want to scrutinize it. We don't have anything. What do you do? You go down there and say, let me operate the machinery? You see what I'm saying? It's very, very difficult. You would have to go in and replace all those people with people that you absolutely trust. And even as much as I travel in the United States and speak to people, I don't know that many people personally and what their talents are that I can send them in to become an NSA, an NSA you know, extractor of code and know the filing system. I mean, they have layers after layers of secrecy. It'd be very difficult to get in there and do that. John Kennedy tried. He was betrayed by the Bay of Pigs. You know, he went to bed authorizing the airstrikes against the um, uh, Cuban Air Force in favor of the, uh, of the invasion force. And during the night when George Bundy, skull and bones, globalist, conspirator, canceled the air support. And Kennedy was livid the next day. And he swore that he'd stop these kinds of CIA black operations. And that's one of the reasons why the deep state decided they had to do away with him. This wasn't a rogue. Mafia rogue element within the government. It was the government themselves taking out the president. Because the government really is the deep state. The rest of the people are just ornaments to make you think that things are going on. In fact, the only reason the judges really abide by the Constitution is to fool you into thinking that the Constitution is so. But whenever they really want to put you in prison without any Constitution, they do it. And there have been people, you look through the internet, there's been several people that go to prison unjustly, can't get out, indefinite detention. 
But because it's not happening generally, we still think we're free. In fact, Mormons think if you're allowed to go to church on Sunday that we uh, live in a free country. That's their mantra for religious freedom. But you know, if you don't have property rights, if you don't have the right to discriminate on your property, choose who will come, you don't have real liberty. We're losing liberty every year. That's why if I pray, if they ever chose me to pray, thank the Lord for the few remaining freedoms we have left. That would make people think. <laughs> but that's politically incorrect. Um, what can we do about these things? Well, first of all, you have to realize that just a little food and water are not enough for what's coming. It might be for losing your job, it might be for a temporary setback, but it's not going to be enough for the war that is going to come. You have to be prepared for massive social unrest that will come when there's no food or electricity and no shipments in from abroad. You know, we're gobbling up all of our arable farmland here in Utah and putting houses on it. So there's no way to revert back to an agriculture where we can grow our own here in Utah, let alone have enough water to do that. And in Las Vegas, even less. I mean, that city is going to empty out fairly quickly when there's no uh, government services. You can think about sewers backing up, and no water at the tap. Every time I have one of these jugs of orange juice, and, and uh, you know, I empty it out, I fill it with water. We have a well of water, so it's not chlorinated, it's not fluorinated, and it just keeps up. Now, I have large cisterns and other preparedness things too, but I also have the little jugs. Because for short-term things, it's just easy to grab a jug, the jug. So the little types of things you can do, even in an apartment, you can store you know, some water to keep going. But you need to have alternate sources of electricity as well. Got to have a generator. Generators are cheap. Don't be stingy and not have a generator. And you got to have enough fuel to run the generator for at least a, you know, a week or so. And you can do that with small barrels uh, or multiple gas cans, etc. You know, aren't you irritated, though, about these new safety gas cans that you can't ever empty out because they're nothing for the spouts on well, you check the internet, and there's all kinds of spouts available that you can replace those anti-state safety devices that irritate you so much. <laughs> but you want to keep some fuel. I prefer, for long term, in a situation, diesel generators rather than propane. Just because when propane's out, when your tank is out, and in an EMP and war scenario, you're not going to be able to get anyone to come and refill it. You can't go down to the gas station and do that. If there's no electricity, it takes electricity to pump out propane into your tank. That's why I like diesel. Better diesel stores, much, much better than gasoline, almost indefinitely, if water doesn't get in it. They're a little more expensive, but uh, they give more power. The per amount of gallon of fuel, you get more power out of diesel than, than anything else. So do have a generator. It's good to have battery backup for things so that you don't have to run your generator. The problem with the generator is it burns fuel. It goes through a lot of money very, very quickly to fuel. So if you have for your normal daytime arrangement some battery backup with a charger, you don't even have to have solar necessarily. Uh, you can just get a charger so that you keep a battery bank of lithium ion phosphate batteries. That's the newest kind of battery that doesn't go bad like lead acid. Just keep the battery bank charged, you have an inverter, so that when you need electricity to run your computer, a few lights and a radio or something, or a microwave during the day, you're running on your battery bank. And then you only have to turn on your generator once or twice a day to charge the battery. That's a very cheap <coughs> hybrid system that will get you good alternate energy uh, for a long time. A lot of this is covered in my book, The, the Secure Home. This is my 600-page book on everything from A to Z on preparedness, including shelters, and how to construct them, the ventilation, the electricity, the water systems, etc. Um, I recently have suffered a, a fire in an aircraft hangar where I stockpiled my books, and some of the books got a little soot damage on them that crept in from even though they were in boxes. And so we have quite a few books tonight here that are going to be, this is normally $45, but anyone that's got a little sit damage is only $10. So if you really want to get, this is the new fourth edition, the latest on solar 
and all of the newest inverters, the special self-consumption inverters, a lot of new stuff coming out in solar. It's all in this book, as well as everything else, and uh, a complete appendix with hard to find things. So if you've always wanted to have this big book, you can get uh, a cheap one here tonight because of a little bit of soot damage. Same thing with strategic relocation, my North American guide to safe places. Now, you're living in a fairly safe place unless you live around Hill Air Force Base or uh, you know, a target area. But you may have children that are living in unsafe areas because the jobs are where the big cities are and the big cities are where the unsafe areas are. So they may need a copy. So there are quite a few of these, a little bit of soot damage on these available also for um, that you might want to pick up for your children. The book that's probably the most useful for all of you here who have basements is how to do a high security shelter in the home. Just by taking a portion of the basement and you put up a do-it-yourself shelter, uh, doesn't cost a lot of money. It's not like you know, for me, you don't have to get permits. Uh, if you ask them, they'll tell you you do, but you don't. It's right in your own home. Nobody's going to know that it's there. You can do it privately. You can do it yourself. It's got full architectural plans on how to do this special shelter and conceal it inside a basement. Concealment's very important because you see, if there's a massive social unrest someday, and you've got a mob coming down the street, don't even think about taking out your gun and waving at them, you know, and stopping a mob of people. You know, it's just not wise. You don't want to be shooting people who are hungry anyway. But you do want to get out of the way so that you don't have to confront them. And so you leave your doors and your windows open so they don't break anything. You leave a few things on the shelves and you retreat to your shelter that's concealed and they can't find you and that's where your valuables and your food are. That's a good strategy. Rather than bulletproofing the house, you know, we talk about that. There's all kinds of plans of how to, if you want to do bulletproofing, it's in a secure home. But the wiser choice and more economical choice for most people is do a concealed safe room so you can just get out of the way and live again another day. Just a minute, I'll take questions in a few minutes. Uh, we're almost out of time, so I need to hurry. Uh, and this is a little pamphlet we published called 10 Packs for Survival. 10 survival lists of things that you need to stockpile, including a dynamite barter list of things to stockpile that you can trade for people. I mean, you think about manufacturing your own light bulb someday when they're out, or glue, or duct tape people. You know, or a grabber screw, how valuable those are for people who are just desperate for something to fix. And those are cheap to store, but they're really like money someday when you are out of money. It replaces your need for money when you have a good barter <coughs> storage. I do recommend that people keep a source of cash on hand. I have some gold and silver stockpile as well, but hardly anybody knows the value of gold and silver anymore. Can you imagine taking out a gold coin and saying, now this is worth $2,000 and I want change, you know, for it. Sorry, we don't have any change to give. You see, it's too valuable. And people don't know the value. My brother, who's pretty wealthy, gives out silver dollars as tips. And more and more he's frustrated now because nobody knows what it is. What's this? You know, as if he gave him some faith that that's a silver dollar doesn't know what it is. It doesn't register. So you can see how difficult it is to get people to say, well, that's worth 13 bucks you know, to get value. So cash is going to be king in the first months of the greenbacks. They aren't going to be printing anymore in, war, in, in the initial EMP things. Even they won't have electricity. So I'm just saying, if you've got stockpiles of cash, you're going to be able to go a long way. So I recommend keeping at least three months of cash uh, in your home. And that means you've got to have a safe room. You've got to have a safe or something very secure to keep that cash in. But that's wise to do. Um, my son Andrew is back there. At, oh, I see it's already got a lot of people back there. But, uh, anyway, he's got plenty of books. Uh, these, if the, if the damaged ones are gone, these are still at a probably 30% discount, even the good new ones too. So be sure to pick one up there, the cheapest you'll ever find here. Okay, I'll take questions. Real quick question. Yes. What do you think about the inland port? The what? The inland port here in Utah. Well, they're basically trying to get a relationship with a port over there. I don't see anything you know, wrong with having an inland 
more important relationship with IUP. No, I mean the sale of the land that we did to China, making the inland port, where China's saying they can bring in whatever they want, and we don't have a right to inspect it. And it's uh, larger than the Salt Lake Airport. Yeah, that's absolutely, you know, we've got so many Republicans that are just desperate for anything that's financial gain, and they don't see any danger in China whatsoever. No, I'm opposed to that, absolutely. China, for example, has that kind of poor relationship in, 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 in Long Beach, and they can bring in almost anything, including, you know, military. It's a Trojan horse. Yeah, it's a Trojan horse. Uh, there was somebody else who had a question. You have a question first. Yes. Which books are recently revised? I have the whole collection from about five to ten years old. Okay. Which one should I get it replaced? All three of these have just been updated this year. So uh, but if you have a previous purchase of those, you get them for half price. If you pur purchase them previously. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. Uh, Bill Browder. I don't know if you've heard of Bill Browder. He's yeah. A venture capitalist. Yeah. In Russia, yeah. and he claims that Putin is after him, personal enemy. He comes out and says that uh, Russia, uh, their economy is the size of New York, and their military is about the third that size. And there's a lot of propaganda that tries to scare us into thinking that they are a strong military force. What do you think of those words that he says? Well, he's, he's wrong. Bill Browder is a darling of the establishment. And, uh, you know, you don't get to be wealthy in there without dealing with your own set of oligarchs there in Russia, which he was. And the trouble is, the oligarchs that he was dealing with got overthrown by Putin. Uh, the original oligarchs that faked the demise of the Soviet Union, they were the original congressmen, Berezovsky, Kaczynski, et cetera. They were the original congressmen behind the, well, behind the poll here. They were the ones really running the show. As soon as the, they engineered the phony fall of the Soviet Union, they, told the state bank to loan them the money to buy up gas prom and the oil industry. That's how they became oligarchs. Well, Browder had an inside relationship with those guys, but Putin overthrew all the original oligarchs and installed his own, which are giving him about a 4% cut of all of their well making Putin about them. So Putin and Browder really is an enemy of Putin. But it's kind of like one mutual corrupt person versus another corrupt. But Browder is touting complete disinformation if he says that uh, and it's true that the Russian economy is not strong, uh, never has been strong, but the Russian military is very, very powerful. And uh, I mean, their nuclear weapons towards the United States. Now, the United States says that they have so many nuclear weapons there, but we haven't had inspectors for 10 years. We built them a, a brand new nuclear reprocessing warhead facility to reprocess all the warheads that we disarmed for them. We gave them back the warheads and then they locked us out so that we can't tell how many warheads they've got on that. And yet we claim that they're in compliance with all treaties. That's what the CIA says, that they're lying. I think Russia has three times what the U.S. has in thrill weight in warheads. And believe me, remember, it's not a matter of high-tech stuff. If all your bases get nuked in a preemptive strike, it doesn't matter if you've got F-35s, if they're dead. It doesn't matter, you see, if you've got air superiority, if they can't fly because they've been nuked. That's why nuclear power is everything in the start of this war. In China, nobody knows. You know, how do you do it? The G20, Trump says, I'm going to do a disarmament deal with Putin and we're going to get rid of nuclear weapons. But what about China? It's like three gunfighters standing off, you know, and the two says, well, let's stand down. But the third guy's over there getting ready to shoot you. What good is any disarmament treaty unless everybody disarms? And of course, it's not verifiable. China's never going to disarm, and neither is Russia. You said at the beginning that you covered the question, what do we have to do or have for fallout protection? Okay. Do you have any more comments on that? You've got to have at least 12 inches of concrete over your head. And that's what this shelter gives you out of concrete block, filled solid, put up over steel decking. And I mean, there's lots of rudimentary ways to do it. Uh, but you've got to remember, in terms of a shelter, one of the worst things you do in a shelter is invite all your relatives in. You've got ratty kids that are crying and whining and moaning because they haven't got their peanut butter or their sugary cereals. And they're driving you crazy and nobody can sleep. When we design a shelter, we like to have compartments and bedrooms that seal off where you can put Aaron children away, you know, that don't destroy the sanity. You can imagine two or three weeks, 
or a month in a shelter with people that you don't get along with. It's really a problem. Uh, and you can imagine being in the dark at that time. So you've got to have light. You've got to have ventilation. And you've got to have self-contained power. That's why you always put a battery pack in the shelter. Even if you've got a solar system on a battery pack that nobody can control except you, and it's inside the shelter. But you don't have it. You want to learn to repair your stuff. You don't want repairmen coming into your concealed shelter to be able to fix things. So everything in the shelter you want to learn how to do yourself. You say, I'm not handy? Get handy. Learn how to do it. I've had wealthy clients, million dollar clients we've designed homes for, written a big manual for them on how to take care of all the system. They still call me up. What do I do with this? Go to the manual. I don't have time to do that. Look, I'm not going to be available. You know, when war comes. So learn to do it yourself first. If you don't understand, then call me. But you see, learn to be handy. Learn to have tools. Have a toolbox in your shelter. How are you going to fix things if you don't have a toolbox? You see, to do things. Other question? Yes, sir. Kind of a different question. I'm, I'm uh, doing a correspondence with a guy at work about the church, and he's you know, very hostile. And he basically says, you know, it's false. It's essentially a, a secret combination. As an expert on secret combination, I was wondering if you could provide insight of how the church stacks up as a secret combination, what they do and do not have in common with others. Well, one of the problems with the church is they have covered up for inconvenient history for many years. Um, you know, even to admitting that Brigham Young never taught the Adam God doctrine. He did teach the Adam God doctrine. It was embarrassing, and so they just kind of let it go by. But, um, and when you teach infallibility in the church, and then people find out that, oh, brother made a mistake, then it really kind of undermines testimony. And so it's easy to find hypocritical information on the internet, and it's hard to combat that. So I don't try to go there too much. I say, look, I will be willing to entertain your questions because I know all the answers, and they're not all positive about church. I admit, there have been errors that have been made. I'll tell you those errors, but first of all, I want you to do one thing. I want you to read the Book of Mormon, and I want you to see if you can feel the spirit of war in the book. That's the only question. I don't care whether it meets or agrees with the Bible or anything, or you see Connor. Don't look for God. Just see if you can feel the spirit of the Lord when Nephi pours out a spirit about these are the words of Christ, and I testify to it, or Benadi stands up and says, you know, this and that. See if you can feel the spirit of the Lord. If they can't, then we can discuss the things, but it's not going to do any good. Because if you, the, the real test of any conversion is can you feel the Spirit of the Lord in the Book of Mormon? That's how I got a testimony. My father was smart enough to say, Son, I'm not going to let you be a member of the church just because of me. He made me read the Bible until I felt what the Spirit of the Lord was like. And then he said, Now you can read the Book of Mormon. See if the Spirit of the Lord is there. Very easy to get a testimony. But we're just spinning our wheels if we go through the arguments that you can't win because the point is the church has made mistakes. And then you've got to make the case of how the church is still true even though prophets make mistakes. And that's a tough sell for even members of the church who feel like any criticism or negative thing about the prophet means that you're apostate if you talk about it. And so we've got a problem in the sense that we need to, dis we need to get back to our roots, which is, if the Spirit of the Lord is in the Book of Mormon, then if it was a fraud, the Lord would never allow a spirit. If the Spirit's there, it can't be a fraud. Did Joseph make, make some mistakes? Yes. Did he practice polygamy? Yes. Did he have moment? Did he convert with two young women? Yes. But the point is, when he was acting as a prophet during the Book of Mormon, he was acting as a prophet. And so it's a tough sell to someone who because the church is in a bad position, you know, when you make the statement, we're the only true church, you naturally offend everyone in the world. Because it's a real higher than thou standard. And they expect you to be perfect to be part of the only true church on the face of the earth. And we're not perfect. But we should be trying. We should be working harder. We should be improving every year. And then people will have the respect and want to. Yes, sir. Can you put names and faces on the gold list for the stream? Yeah, sure. Uh, you know, we only know the public face of the big top loans, like Henry Kissinger's probably up there really, really high. Zbigniew Brzezinski was too. George Soros is really big up there. 
But nobody knows except them who are the secret guys calling the shots to them. And we don't have to know, really. Because we can track what globalists are doing now without knowing who's calling the shots. So I don't waste my energy trying to ferret out who those are as much as I try to track where they're going. And, who, and you can't, just because they're following a globalist agenda doesn't mean that they're a diagonal globalist or a knowing conspirator. There's a lot of yes men in government, a lot of yes men in the military. Ollie North, for example, is a conservative. He was deeply involved in the Iran conflict. He knew about running drugs for the CIA, but he thought it was for a patriotic purpose. Robert Stinnett on the Pearl Harbor thought FDR did the right thing. It's right there in his book. That's probably why he got it published by mainstream, because he believed that it was the right thing to do to get us into the war. Oh, I mean, I just roll my eyes when I think of how easy it is for mainstream people to buy into, uh, without being a knowing conspirator, to get talked into a patriotic viewpoint. Listen, I, we're out of time, and Lal is here. I can talk to you afterwards until about 9.30 and private questions, but it's been a pleasure to be with you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Joel. You're awesome. And thank you all for coming.